I've heard uh, people already commenting on the fact that they've noticed me wearing glasses today. And so I'll just start out by saying, you know, congregation, I thought y'all looked good before, but with my glasses on, you look a lot better, right? I really do. I really do. I'm very thankful for it. You know, these, these lenses are so helpful to bring things into clarity for us. And I don't know about you, but, you know, when you hear those passages of Romans, sometimes it's helpful to have, you know, some prescription lens to help bring those passages of Scripture into a little bit more clarity. Now, in order to provide that lens, St. Paul actually does that for us in the preceding verses of Romans, right? So, in fact, what I'd like to do, you know, Vicar Peter did this here this past Sunday for the Sunday of Transfiguration, so I want you to go ahead and grab your pew Bible and turn to page 1,753. We're going to be in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 8. Any of you that maybe you brought your Bible with you? Again, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, Pew Bible, 1753 is the page number. Now, I'm going to start by uh, giving you a key verse that Pastor Dave read for us there in that selection of readings or passages from Romans chapter 5, and that is verse 18. Right, which says, consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. And the lens that the Apostle Paul provides for us, though, comes, as I said, in those preceding verses. So let me back up, and I want to read for you verses 8 through 11. Scripture reads, But God demonstrates, or my preferred translation, God shows his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more? Having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And that key verse, right? Any confirmation students that are in there, if you're going to write down one verse from your sermon notes, write down Romans 5, verse 8. God shows his love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ who gave his life for us in love. There's a very famous uh, saying, I'm sure many of you have probably said this before, and it's that actions speak louder than words, right? You're all very familiar, I think, with this. Maybe you've said it a time or two. Right, I was joking in some of the, uh, on our Saturday service yesterday, I said to them ahead of time, I said, you look, you're about to hear the most loveliest sermon you've ever heard, right? Because it's all about God's love, okay? Well, I guess actions will speak louder than words, right? <laughs> I think we all understand that saying, what we do means more than what we say. And you know, when it comes to love, love is spoken and love is shown. Actions speak louder than words. And the reason I bring all of this up, because that's what we heard there in Romans chapter 5. God shows his love, his one act of righteousness, as it is written in verse 18. You see, God's love is a love that you and I can see. And this is what the season of Lent is really about. Now, this may sound a little bit cheesy, but the season of Lent is not just a season in the sense of S-E-A-S-O-N, but it's actually a season in S-E-E-S-O-N. It is all about seeing the love of God in His Son. And so today, I'd like us to open our eyes, not just today, but throughout this whole season, to see the love of God in Christ Jesus. Because truly, his love is a love that is unlike any other. I mean, consider this, right? A couple of weeks ago, we celebrated something here in February that our culture does every year. What was that? Right, Valentine's Day. And and how does our culture typically celebrate this? Right, with cards, with some chocolate, maybe even some nice red roses? How does God 
show his love for us. Christ dies for us. Or think about it this way. In our culture, what is the symbol for love? Right? A heart. What is God's symbol for love for us? It is the cross. Actions speak louder than words. And that's what I want you to see in this season of Lent. I want you to see God's love that is unleashed for us in Christ Jesus. You know, in fact, if you were to to pick up the scriptures and you just read again and again throughout the book, throughout the scriptures, you will see just this, this ongoing act of God showing us again and again his love. I mean, even from the very beginning, we see how God shows his love for us. In fact, it was actually out of his love that he brought everything into existence. And when he spoke, right, when he formed and filled, as you read in the very first chapter of Genesis, it's almost like with each word that God speaks, it's like, it's like another brushstroke on this divine canvas of creation. As this master artist paints his beloved masterpiece, so beautifully and wonderfully made, Right, God makes heaven and earth, the light and the sky and the sea, creatures of the air and creatures of the deep land and animals, and of course the crown of his creation is human beings made in God's own image. Oh, how right God was when he said it was exceedingly good. And in that very beginning, you see it too there in Genesis chapter 2, we see a God who is in the garden. This, this God who, who's in such love chooses to be with his masterpiece, right? Or as the, the poet will say, he is a God who walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm his own. And there, everything is just perfect, isn't it? Right, this, this picture-perfect paradise, right up until it is not. We heard that today in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve, when they rebel against God and go against what he has commanded, eating that fruit from that tree. And it happens so fast, doesn't it? Once they disobey God, suddenly the entire masterpiece is now ruined by that sin. I mean, completely and thoroughly ruined by sin. And if it was any other artist, right, if it was any other artist, what that artist probably would have done is they would have taken that canvas of creation, that that work of art, and they would have just thrown it away and started over. But not God. No, God shows his love. And that rather than scrapping his creation and starting over, he chooses to begin to save it. Now, of course, he had every right to throw it away, every reason to get rid of it and begin anew. But that's not what he does, because that is his great love for us. You see, God will not let his masterpiece go to waste. He has a plan, a plan to redeem and to restore and to save his now ruined masterpiece. And in fact, there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we get a glimmer, a glimpse of that plan. As God makes a promise, his word, though, is fulfilled in action. And this, brothers and sisters in Christ, is what the season of Lent wants us to see. And in fact, again, as I said earlier, when you look all throughout the scriptures, or you just look all throughout history, or as the Apostle Paul takes us at the very beginning of his letter to the Romans, you will see just how this world has been steeped into sin, a sin that infects and corrupts and hardens the hearts of people to rebel against God. And yet time and again, God continues to show his love for us. You know, my my wife and I, Holly, at the start of this 2023 year, we started doing one of those, you know, read the Bible in a year plans, you know, a little bit each day. And by the way, let me give you a little 15-second commercial on this. Any couples out there, right, if you haven't started doing this, I would encourage you, 
you know, especially with your spouse, find some yearly Bible reading plan. Be in the Word together. You will be amazed at how God nurtures not just your faith, but your relationship with your spouse, as well as your faith and your relationship with God. All right, I'll put it this way, right? As iron sharpens iron, so one spouse sharpens another. So I told you, Holly and I have been in this uh, Bible reading plan for about a year. We've made it through Genesis and Exodus, and praise God, we made it through Leviticus. Be honest, if you can make it through Leviticus, you can make it through the rest of the Bible, right? We've just about finished with the book of Numbers. And all we can talk about, like we do this all the time, we are just blown away at all the times God shows His love to these Israelites who are sinful, disobedient, and hard-hearted over and over again. It just blows our minds that in spite of it all, God will never stop loving them. Time and again, Israel's going to break their word and break their promise, but God will always keep His. Again and again, they may turn away, but the Lord consistently turns toward them in love. And while Israel's hearts may grow hard, God's heart is always warm with love for each and every one of them. You see, He loves and He values Israel, His people, even when they would make themselves unlovable. And I'll be honest with you, I think Israel did a pretty good job at that. Take Exodus, for example. Right after God shows His great love for His people, bringing them up out of that land of oppression and slavery of Egypt, with great signs and wonders, they see how much He loves them. Oh, God will stop at nothing to redeem His people, but how do they respond to God's love? Right, chapters 16 and 17, what are the people doing but griping and grumbling at the Lord? Oh, we don't have enough food. Oh, we have a lack of water. Oh, how we wish we could go back to Egypt. Or think about this. Right after God gives His people His divine commandments, which really is just this divine design for His people to live set apart from the other nations, what do the people do? but almost immediately get to work at breaking each and every one of those commandments, starting with the first. Right, Exodus chapter 32, what do the people do? But they construct this golden calf that they worship and claim is their God who brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And I'm sorry to say that even when you read in Numbers, things don't get any better. The people go from cursing the bread from heaven that God gave them to refusing to enter the land that He had promised. Or how many times throughout the Old Testament do you hear that refrain, the people of Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord and they served idols. I mean, just left and right, you will see the people turning away from God turning towards some false idol, or I'll put it for you this way, turning towards some new fad, spiritualism from the surrounding culture, or turning towards whatever their surrounding nations and culture are telling them is good and right for them to do. How many times do the people of Israel live according to what the world says rather than what God says? Now, of course, none of us would know anything about that, would we? About conforming to the culture, to the ideals and practices that are promoted in our society. Maybe it's ideals and practices that relate to our relationships, or about marriage, gender, or maybe even our own bodies. Or certainly none of us could could relate to serving at the altar of sports, or career, money, success, or maybe even that altar of self. You see, the honest truth is when we hold up the mirror of God's law, we see just how steeped in sin we really are. And the reality is we are far worse off than we ever thought. Now, congregation, I'll be real with you for a moment, and I'll just speak for myself, not for any of you. Look, the truth is the people of Israel that I just got done describing, honestly, I'm no better than them. I'm a griping, grumbling pastor and person. 
I'm a commandment-breaking follower of Christ. I have done evil in the eyes of the Lord and served at the altar of self. Look, there is no reason for God to love me. And yet, He does. And the same is true for each and every one of you. And not only is it written in Scripture, it is shown, right? God shows His great love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you and for me. That's love. Actions speak louder than words. And God shows His great love for us men and for our salvation when He comes down from heaven and is incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and made man. Or as Scripture says, when the Word of God became made his dwelling among us. And you know what this means. It means that in love, God has chosen to enter in to this ruined masterpiece. And the price, the price for our redemption and restoration, the wages of our sin, is death. And that's the price that Jesus pays for you And that's the price that Jesus pays for me. You see, in such great love for us, He allows Himself to be smitten, stricken, and afflicted, this spotless, sinless Son of God. He allows Himself, right? He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. He who was truly innocent takes the place of those of us who are guilty. He allows Himself to be forsaken by the Father, so that you and I never would be. And there on Calvary, his heel is struck as he is nailed to that tree. But brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the picture of God's grace. Arms stretched out wide in love for you and for me. This is what the season of Lent calls us to see, the ultimate sacrifice that the Son has made for us. Actions speak louder than words, and there is no action that speaks louder than the cross. For truly, truly I say to you, while we were still sinners, God showed His great love for us in this, that Christ died for us us. Congregation, I don't don't know if you really heard what I just said. God showed His great love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Congregation, I don't know if you heard what I just said to you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to hear that, not just with your ears, but in your heart, in your soul. I want these words to pervade every fabric, every fiber of your very being. Christ died for you. Don't ever forget that. He died all for you and for me. You see, His one act of righteousness, it speaks the loudest words to us. Words like, I redeem you. I forgive you. I love you. Crucified and resurrected, Jesus redeems and He restores His once ruined masterpiece. He delivers us from sin and death and the devil, and Jesus even makes us a new promise, Scripture tells us. You see, our divine artist has plans to repaint over this canvas of creation. As it says in Revelation, Behold, I will make all things new. You see, God is not done. He is not done showing His great love for us in Christ Jesus. Actions speak louder than words. So this season of Lent, brothers and sisters in Christ, come and see God's love in action. Or in a few moments when the Lord Himself invites us to His table, come and taste and see in the true body and blood of Christ just how good God 
really is in Christ Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which truly surpasses all understanding, continue to guard our hearts and minds in Him from now until that life everlasting. Amen.